From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. Welcome to Inside the Ice House. I'm your host, Teresa DeLuca. I'm a member of the Intercontinental Exchange Communications team and co-producer of this podcast, along with my colleague, Pete Ash. Today, we're going to talk about timing. Timing, for better or worse, has a profound effect on our lives. In business, politics, sports, even our personal lives, how often do we hear stories of being a few years too early or just a few years too late? On occasion, the stars align and timing works out perfectly. Though timing isn't everything, timing is definitely something. It's a great statement and one I can't take credit for. It belongs to the man sitting across from me, Scott Cooper. Managing partner at venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. You're likely to find Scott in Silicon Valley, but today he joins us on the East Coast, inside the library of the New York Stock Exchange, a somewhat fitting location as his new book, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, Venture Capital and How to Get It, comes out this week. Before we get ahead of ourselves, let's go back 10 years, June 2009. Nearly 3,000 miles from Wall Street in Menlo Park, California, Two early tech titans, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, decided to launch a venture capital firm. Andreessen Horowitz was based on the idea that a network of people and institutions could help founders improve their chances of making it to the next level and even beyond. Their first hire? Well, we're about to hear from him. How did Scott Cooper's own career lead him to Silicon Valley? What does the VC landscape look like 10 years later? And of course, how does one go about getting venture capital? Scott's answers to those questions and more, coming up next. And now a word from Arthur Bergman, CEO of Fastly, NYSE ticker symbol FSLY. Fastly is an edge cloud platform. We help deliver digital experiences for amazing customers like Spotify and Ticketmaster and New York Times. We have started eight years ago. It's been an amazing journey. We work very closely with our customers. We're a very critical part in their business. We're very selective in type of customers we want in our network. Fastly is built by developers for developers. Fastly is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. My sense is that Scott Cooper enjoys staying busy. As a lawyer turned entrepreneur turned VC, he has overseen the growth of Andreessen Horowitz from a three-person operation to over 150 employees, 300 million in funds to a cool 7 billion. He is a co-founder and co-director of the Stanford Venture Capital Directors College and teaches VC and corporate governance courses at Stanford Law and the Haas School of Business, as well as the Bolt School of Law at UC Berkeley. He is vice chair of the investment committee for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital and previously served as chairman of the board of the National Venture Capital Association. He now adds a new title, author. Prior to joining ICE, I was a social media editor at Forbes. Phrases like Sand Hill Road, Andreessen Horowitz, Funding Round, and IPO were all part of the regular newsroom jargon. Needless to say, it's an honor to be joined by one of the biggest players in Silicon Valley. Scott, welcome to the Ice House. Thanks for having me. Scott, Wall Street and Sand Hill Road share a certain symbiosis. Venture capital is focused on helping entrepreneurs and their respective startups get the funding they need to grow their companies. Our focus here at the New York Stock Exchange is, of course, someday welcoming those companies to the public markets through the IPO process. It's an exciting week for you as your book is about to be published. And of course, you're also celebrating Andreessen's 10th anniversary. Is New York the first leg on your book tour? It is. We had a quick party in San Francisco for uh, friends and family and the firm, and now we're off to the East Coast. So lots of fun. All right. I saw you signing some a few a few yes. copies of your book. Yes, so. I'm, I'm learning how to sign very quickly and efficiently. I'm sure there's, a, there's much more signing to come. Having read the book cover to cover, I feel like I've got an instruction manual right on my hands about raising venture capital. So why you know why now? Why did you want to publish it? Yeah. So I've been in tech for about 25 years now. So I actually started as an investment banker, 
and had the chance to spend some time here taking companies public and then spent about eight years as an entrepreneur in a uh, startup company. And then for 10 years, as you mentioned, now been in venture. And what I found is there continues to be a big appetite for interest in what's happening in the venture world, but quite frankly, not as many resources as people would like. And so the book really is a bit of a compilation of all the questions that I got over the years from entrepreneurs about, should I raise venture capital? What does it mean to do so? What happens when I take venture capital? And how do I make sure that how do I make sure that I protect my interests uh, when I do so? Having read, you know, this book, did you have a particular person in mind when you were writing it, whether it was yourself or, or one of your daughters or somebody that you've spoken with about venture and giving them advice? Yeah, the the kind of persona that I was trying to keep in mind was kind of the canonical entrepreneur who is either raising money now or thinking about it. And then also just lots of people who are kind of in and around the venture ecosystem and who just have an interest in what's happening in the broader technology community. But I, I must admit, my uh, my wife was my final editor. And when she told me that she could read about 80% of it and understand it, then I figured that job was uh, mostly complete. Is there something that you wish you had had when you were starting out? And I mean, I know venture capital in those days was certainly the Wild West, quite literally. When you were looking at LoudCloud, did you, you know, was it trial by fire or did you just go in hoping you you had your questions ready. Yeah, it was mostly trial by fire. So, And before that, as I mentioned, I had been an investment banker. And um, I started actually my career doing life sciences and investment banking. Okay. And then because the technology boom was happening at that time, there was so much more software activity. And so similarly, uh, it was trial by fire there, kind of trying to learn how to uh, deal with the software world. So it would be nice sometimes to not always have to go things that way. <laughs> You're certainly no stranger to people asking you questions, as you said. And, you know, if you're speaking on panels or you're doing podcasts or you're doing interviews, I'm sure there's a lot of questions that you get repeatedly. And I'm sure you're saying, you know, I get this question a lot. I get that question a lot. Hence, you're writing the book. But are there any topics VC related or, or business related that you don't get a lot from people that you that surprise you that you don't get those questions or that that you'd kind of like to talk about? Yeah, I think the one that I get the least amount, which surprises me, is whether venture is even appropriate for some businesses. And so because we live in the Valley, I think it's part of our normal vernacular. And so people automatically assume that makes sense. And part of what I hope the book does is to help entrepreneurs understand what it is that motivates and incents VCs and therefore make sure that that's what you're signed up to as an entrepreneur, because there's lots of other forms of capital out there. And you know, it, it's not a, it doesn't make you a bad person if you decide that VC isn't the right one for you. So that's mm -hmm. one that I often feel like people skip over before they actually kind of critically ask themselves that foundational question. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a reason, you know, whether it's just the culture of the day or seeing all these DC companies come up in, in the ranks that people automatically say, you know, venture is something, is a way I need to go versus friends or family or, or bank loans or, or working with banks directly? Yeah, I think that's true, particularly in the coast, right? So if you live in, you know, uh, California or New York or Boston, I think you are, you're just kind of versed in this language and you know people in the industry, mm -hmm. or you know, entrepreneurs. What I think is a big issue, you know, that we have today is, you know, we haven't geographically distributed kind of the benefits of technology in many respects. And again, a part of what I hope the book will do is to kind of demystify it, particularly for people who are outside the coast in a way that helps them figure out whether venture makes sense for them and whether entrepreneurship is the appropriate place for them to be. Mm -hmm. The book follows the VC life cycle because, as you point out, if you're going to raise money from VCs or join a company that is venture backed, it helps to understand why VCs do what they do. Yeah. So in your 10 years at Andreessen, in its simplest terms, what is it that you do? <laughs> so basically what we do is we provide money to aspiring companies. Often it's two, three people who have a business plan, an idea, but probably don't have a product at that point in time. And we hope that over seven, eight, 10 years, those companies develop into companies like a Facebook or a Twitter, right? They can be standalone public companies that can go public on you know places like the NYSE. And that's the goal. Now, the reality often, as you know, is kind of uh, very different from the goal. The unfortunate reality is a lot of what we invest in, probably up to half of it, never really materializes in any fashion. You probably lose most or all of your investment there. So we're really playing for one or two out of 10 companies as part of a portfolio that could actually have real outsized returns and ultimately end up as a public company. And over those past 10 years, what would you say you're most proud of in the investments, it doesn't, you know, whether that is a large investment that, that like you said, it was successful, or maybe one that wasn't, but it was a great company nonetheless. Yeah, one that comes to mind, uh, which is a, a recently public company, is a company called Okta, which uh, is in the enterprise software company, and 
to us, what's exciting about that is just literally having seen it through the entire life cycle. So it was one of the very first investments we made when we started the fund 10 years ago. And at the time, it was what we would call a seed investment. So we literally invested a half a million dollars behind two great entrepreneurs who were just leaving their jobs at Salesforce.com and had this idea that you would need a whole new way to kind of do security and user authentication in, a, in the new world of applications we had. And so what was most gratifying about that was seeing literally the conception of the company 10 years ago and then a couple of years ago and, and now trading as a public company, kind of the fruition of all their uh, hard work. As I mentioned, I'm a Forbes alum and the magazine recently featured Mark Andreessen on its elusive cover. The adjoining story had an exclusive that Andreessen Horowitz is registering as a financial advisor, renouncing your status as a VC firm entirely. Why the move? Yeah, so I hate to break the news to you, but it's actually, uh, the news is not quite as exciting as uh, perhaps maybe uh, Forbes made it out to be. But uh, what actually happened is, uh, and I, I will not bore your listeners with the details, but we decided to register in the same way that like hedge funds and other funds are registered. So mm-hmm. the main reason is we, were, we had been investing and we continue to invest in crypto related technologies. Those don't qualify under the current rules for venture capital uh, exemption. And so we needed in order to be able to do that and to run it as an integrated firm. But the reality is, our business hasn't changed. We are still venture investors. You're not going to see us selling you know, public stocks to retail investors. That's not our business. We literally just kind of voluntarily agreed to a higher regulatory structure in order to give ourselves, quite frankly, more degrees of freedom on the business. Interesting. And, and I know that he mentioned you'll be able to go in on some of those, I don't want to say riskier bets, but just different industries that, like you said, have different classifications. Yeah, I think that's right. So, and we can do an entire podcast on crypto, but for time's sake, <laughs> what's your general view of the industry right now? Yeah, so we are big believers in crypto. Most of what we're focused on is what we call crypto networks. And what we mean by that is it's a new way to build a digital service, and a digital service could be any kind of website, but where the kind of governance and ownership and management of that service is decentralized as opposed to centralized. So, you know, if you think about, you know, a company like a Facebook, obviously Facebook is a centralized company in the Mm -hmm. sense that, you know, kind of there is a management team and a set of shareholders who ultimately determine kind of corporate actions. The beauty that we think of, of crypto is you can actually have the benefits of decentralization, which means you have open governance standards, you have, you know, kind of a community of users who can, you know, kind of make sure that everything is happening above board. And therefore, it can become a platform for application developers to build new applications on top of. Mm-hmm. So it to us, it really looks like basically everything else we do in the venture business, which is most of the things we're doing are backing small teams of entrepreneurs who are trying to build a product. It just happens to be that the kind of architecture of that product is this in this decentralized nature as opposed to effectively a traditional corporate structure. Well, I know in the past you know, couple of weeks, we've seen crypto starting to kind of bubble up again, and that's right. exciting. So we'll see what happens there. You also just announced a new growth fund adding between 2 to 2.5 billion, am I correct? Yeah, 2.2 to be precise. Yeah. Okay. For AH's newest partner, David George, who you actually wrote about on yep. the website, which is a16z.com. That's right. And you specifically wrote about his hire and his plans to help invest in late stage venture investing capabilities. Can you tell me a little bit more about those late stage opportunities? Absolutely. So we've been uh, what we call a multi stage investor since the beginning. So, mm-hmm. meaning we've done seed stuff all the way through what we call this later stage venture. A big trend that obviously you're aware of, and I'm sure your listeners are, is this idea that companies are staying private a lot longer. And so as we see that continue to evolve, we realize there are more opportunities along the kind of maturation curves for these companies for us to invest in. And historically, we hadn't broken that out into its own fund, and we hadn't had someone like David who was kind of a specialist in that area. We had our same partners who were doing early stage stuff also doing the later stage. And so this new fund gives us both the financial flexibility, as well as kind of the resourcing to be able to say, hey, this is a really, really important area of focus for us. And it's a great complement to what we're doing on the early stage side by being able to, in many cases, double down on existing investments we already made at the early stage and increase our exposure over time. And he'll lead the charge on that. And I imagine you'll you'll have some more partners who will help him out later on. That's right. Yeah. So cool. David is uh, David's working on it. And then myself and Mark Andreessen are also working with him there. And we're building out a team. And over time, uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly add to, pe- add to it as the opportunity expands. You once said you would never touch biotech. <laughs> Why is now the right time to reconsider? Yeah. So we use the term bio, just to be clear, uh, which is, we think, a little bit different from traditional biotech. So. The honest answer is we've always invested around this uh, idea of kind of software as a foundational enabling technology. Mm-hmm. And we've always viewed our charter as to you know invest in things where software is intersecting with various vertical industries. And you're right, we had not done traditional biotech before, but we start, what we started to see kind of really in 2013, 14 was this convergence between computer science and life sciences. Mm-hmm. And so in many ways, 
the BioFund really is actually no different from what we've been doing for the last you know, 10 years, which is just an application of computer science to a vertical industry. But mostly we are in the talent business. And what I mean by that is we're in the business of kind of identifying really interesting entrepreneurs who are doing something cutting edge in software. And we just started to see this confluence of engineers uh, really interested in the intersection of those two uh, domains. And so that's why we started doing it about 2013. And then mm -hmm. in 2015, we thought the opportunity was ripe enough to break out a separate fund and, and uh, invest in it. I mean, it's a powerful industry. And I think having that money go to, you know, who knows what could, it could save lives, really. So yeah. it's exciting. Ten years into the firm, money is no longer a precious commodity that it once was, and therefore something else needs to be that differentiator in the marketplace. Is is that found in in bio or late stage funding? You know what what makes you stand out? Like you said, that that isn't just we have the money. Yeah, you're exactly right. So the way this business has changed over the last ten years is that there was a point in time for most of the first thirty or so years of venture where having access to capital was your differentiator, and that's what the venture capital firms had. As, you, as you've seen in lots of different areas, you know, money is free flowing, so it's still, it is definitely a commodity and, and no longer a scarce resource. What that means for us and for, we believe, other venture firms is we have to do something other than that to be competitive in the space. And mm -hmm. so what we've done as a firm, we have about 160 employees actually now, and about 100 of them focus on the post-investment side of working with our portfolio companies, helping them with everything from sales and business development opportunities to PR and marketing opportunities to talent acquisition. And we think for venture capital, quite frankly, to be relevant for the next 10 and 20 years, it has to do something to actually facilitate and help the entrepreneurial and the company building process and not just be a source of capital. Mm -hmm. And kind of going off that, do you think that venture capital as we know it, there's a lot of different opinions here. Would you say it's in flux? It's changing from the past. Absolutely. What it was 10, 10 years ago, which was small and has since grown tremendously. Yeah, it's definitely in flux. It was a really, it was a pretty staid business for, again, most of the first 30, 40 years of the business. The big things that changed over the last 10 to 15 years were, number one, uh, there's a lot more seed activity happening now, right? So, in fact, I think in the U.S., I read a number that something like 500 new firms yep. have been formed over the last 10 years, kind of focused on the seed category. So, on the one end, what that's done is it's made it probably easier than ever for, you know, raising 500000 a million, $2 million. The other thing that's changed over the last 10 years is the, the end user markets for these businesses has gotten bigger and companies are staying private longer. So, you've got this weird dichotomy of... It's cheaper than ever to start a company, but it's probably more expensive than ever to scale a business just because these businesses are trying to go after, you know, very massive global opportunities. So that's really changing the nature of our business. It means we've got, you know, lots of these later stage investors that didn't exist mm -hmm. before, some of whom are, you know, your investors, right? So, you know, mutual funds and hedge funds. Yep. Uh, we've got sovereign wealth funds. And I think it's going to be continue to be in flux. And the, probably the one constant is what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, we're all going to have to figure out what our differentiation is in this market because capital loan certainly isn't going to be it. I want to go back to LoudCloud for yeah. a minute, as that was your first kind of entrance. I know that you worked in investments before, but that was your first entrance into working with Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. I've heard it said that Mark is very persuasive, as most successful entrepreneurs tend to be. What was LoudCloud and you know, what did it kind of turn into? Yeah. So LoudCloud, Mark and Ben, and we actually had two other co-founders, Tim and Insec, uh, the four of them started LoudCloud in 1999. And the basic premise behind LoudCloud was essentially what now has become Amazon Web Services. So their basic idea was, hey, you know, when you write, if you're a developer and you write code, you shouldn't have to worry about what is the networking infrastructure behind that code mm -hmm. or the storage or the servers. You ought to kind of be able to write your code and it ought to just magically work. You know, the analogy we used to use was it should be utility, right? So when you plug your plug into the wall socket, you don't care how the electricity got there, right? You just know it powers your computer and that's all you need to worry about. So that was the basic idea. Um, it was a great idea. And as you kind of led off this segment, uh, timing, unfortunately, often does matter in these businesses. Uh, and uh, we were probably, unfortunately, 10 years too early. But uh, it was really just, you know, this was kind of height of, you know, what turned out to be the bubble, right? They started the company in September 99. And the excitement was palpable. You know, I, as I wrote in the book, I met Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz and made what was probably at the time a very irrational decision to quit a very good job uh, right around the time my wife and I were trying to buy a home and we were having our first child together. But, you know, lucky for me, I kind of, you know, passed that IQ test and, uh, you know, kind of decided to go ahead and move forward. Now, were you living in, in California? Yeah, we were. We time? were in California at the time. Yeah, the company okay. was based in a town called Sunnyvale, which, mm -hmm. if you know, the area is kind of where basically, uh, you know, that's where the heart of Silicon Valley right. used to be. Uh, yep. Now, of course, uh, San Francisco is much more the heart of the valley today. Yeah. Mark sat down with Business Insider's Henry Blodgett in 2009 to yep. discuss LoudCloud turning into Opsware. Here's what he had to say. 
you know, this is a case where we're actually really proud of what, what, what we did in this case, which is basically reinvented the company from scratch, essentially took the cash and the people and the technology uh, and basically did a restart as a public company, started basically a whole new company called Opsware within the context of the previous company. And then ultimately um, sold it for $2 billion. Right. I mean, tremendously successful over a period of years. Yep. Going back to that moment, though, yep. there are lots of companies that just fail completely. Well, all either. of our competitors, as, as LoudCloud, all of our competitors as LoudCloud went bankrupt, except for us. And so did you stop the burn earlier? Did no, we... Did you see the <laughs> impending crash earlier? What was no. it? Uh, we <laughs> have to give... Um, we, we sold... Uh, we had a magic deal. We pulled out a magic deal, which was we sold our managed services business to EDS, uh, which actually turned out to be a great fit for EDS because of what was happening in their own business. And they were a very big and, and successful company at that stage and had the wherewithal to be able to basically make an investment like that at a time when a lot of other people couldn't. Um, but we pulled off a deal with EDS where we basically sold EDS, our services business, and all the associated assets and the burn rate and everything, but also all of our revenue, all of our customers, um, and actually a lot of our people. Um, went over and sort of that deal saved that deal saved the company. So as Mark mentions, and as you state in the book, you ultimately sold most of the Loud Cloud business to Electronic Data Systems right. (EDS) and restarted as an enterprise software business called Opsware. That's Operation Software Combined. Mm-hmm. Opsware is this what we would call today a pivot? <laughs> I think even in today's parlance, pivot might be a you know, even too euphemistic way of saying it. Uh, yeah, I mean, as everything Mark said is accurate, right? So the only thing that you don't have an appreciation for in that uh, clip is the time period in which this was happening. So right. we sold the business to EDS in 2002. Okay. We had gone public in 2001. We were one of two companies that entire year that went public. Wow. And uh, what happened was, you know, most of our companies had been dot-com companies, a lot of our customers. And so we kind of had this real uh, unfortunate problem of being a public company and effectively having attrition throughout our customer base. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we sold this business in 2002. And as Mark said, it was an amazing, amazing time. And we were incredibly fortunate to get that deal done. The stock kind of traded down to basically 14 cents, which was essentially less than the cash we had on our balance sheet. We had one customer at the time, which was EDS, was kind enough to license the software from us to use in the services business that they had bought. But uh, we did all this stuff as a public company, which was, you know, pretty uh, amazing, amazing thing to go through. And uh, for those of us who were lucky enough to be part of the company, it was just an incredible, incredible learning experience. Yeah. I mean, though timing isn't everything, it's definitely yes, something. It is something. On the topic of pivots, arguably one of the best pivoters of all time belongs to Stuart Butterfield. Absolutely. Andreessen Horowitz invested in 2010 in a gaming company called Tiny Spec. Want to tell us what happened from there? Yeah, and uh, just for the listeners, just to be clear, we are investors in Slack, and as you know, probably they're yeah. they're rumored to be going public uh, one of these days. So I won't say anything about the company pers- uh, about company numbers. But yeah, so Stuart actually the funny story behind Stuart was he had sold before that he had built a company called Flickr, which was kind of really the early first versions of the photo sharing applications, and mm-hmm. it got sold to Yahoo. But when he started that business, he actually initially set out to start a gaming company. And it turned out the gaming company didn't work, and so he pivoted into Flickr, which got sold. And so when he came to us when he was uh, starting this company called Tiny Spec, he, had, he wanted to go back to his gaming roots. And he said, I'm going to go try this gaming business again. And they built this really, really uh, amazing game, but he kind of concluded at some point in time that it just wasn't a viable business. And what he said to us, and there was another venture capital firm also uh, you know, kind of invested at the time, he said, look, we've been using this internal productivity tool as we just to help ourselves develop stuff, and we have a couple months of cash left. Is it okay if we kind of give this a go and see if there's something there? And, uh, you know, to his credit, obviously, they, they uh, did, to your point, kind of the pivot of all pivots and uh, turned something that was basically an internal tool into, you know, kind of a very interesting enterprise software business. And, you know, those things don't always happen. And, uh, you know, as you say, timing is important. Luck is also important. So we had the luck of backing an entrepreneur with incredible stick to itness and incredible kind of vision with Stuart. But, uh, you know, truth be told, we backed a we backed a gaming company that ultimately became a software company. And those pivots don't happen all day long. Oh, no, that's it's a unique story. And Slack is about to list here on the New York Stock Exchange in a few weeks. I know for myself personally, just going back a few years, the first time that my then boss said, hey, guys, we're going to try this thing called Slack. Everybody get on it, create a profile. And it's just one of those things that you you don't forget. And you're like, what is this? And it becomes a part of your life so quickly. Yeah, yeah. So switching to the current IPO climate, in 2019 so far, three of your unicorns, that is companies with a valuation of over a billion dollars, and that would be for these three, Lyft, PagerDuty, and Pinterest, obviously Slack will chalk that up to four. They've already gone public this year. Is the IPO market hitting its stride, or do you see an eventual tipping point? 
I think right now the market is is pretty good. So I think you, it's a little bit of you have to distinguish, I think, between kind of stuff that's right in the strike zone of the IPO market versus stuff that is maybe, you know, not not out of favor, but I would say less in favor. And so I think the sweet spot right now is software companies, you know, 35, 40 percent growth rates, line of sight visibility into profitability. So kind of, you know, companies that are not consuming significant amounts of cash, but they're mm-hmm. growing at, at good rates, but not crazy rates. I don't think you have to be growing at 100 percent a year. Uh, to uh, be attractive in the IPO market. You know, we've seen some other companies right there where they're they're growing very fast, but there's more cash consumption in those businesses. And I think given particularly some of the macro challenges that we have ongoing right now with uncertainty around China and other things, you know, it's, there's a little bit more of a kind of very high growth off mentality in the IPO market, but a kind of reasonable growth mentality on, I guess, would be the simplest way to describe it. Mm-hmm. After the break, I'll talk with Scott about growing up in the Lone Star State, his own journey to Sand Hill Road, and the personal side of investing. And now a word from Tufin, NYSE ticker symbol T-U-F-N. We provide policy management for large organizations. Your security is only as good as your policy, and we are the security policy company. So we enable companies to implement network changes in minutes instead of days with dramatically better security. We have over 2,000 customers worldwide. 300 companies in the global 2,000 are Tufin customers. We're going to invest more in R&D, go after this huge market opportunity that we have, and it's very exciting to look at the next phase of Tufin. Welcome back. Before the break, I was talking with Scott Cooper, managing partner at venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, about the venture capital industry and his new book, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, Venture Capital and How to Get It. Scott, let's go back to the beginning. You were born in New Haven, Connecticut, and raised in Houston, Texas. Any reason for that? My dad's a doctor and uh, kind of had done his uh, training in New Haven in Connecticut. And then uh, this was back at the time where there was this thing called a draft. He ended up in San Antonio in the Air Force. That's how we ended up in Texas. And I think my parents thought they would be there for, you know, probably two years and then go back to the East Coast. And somehow two turned into 50 and they're still there. So then you went from Houston to California. I saw that you were a graduate of Stanford. That's right. How did you decide to make the jump? You know, I always wanted to go to Stanford, even though I'd never been to California. It just seemed like an interesting place to be. And truth be told, I I didn't get in when I first applied uh, out of high school. And so I ended up going east to the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, I'm kind of an outdoors person and just kind of decided after about a year in West Philly that it was time to try something else. So second time around turned out to be a charm and had the opportunity to go out west. Northern California. Yep. I saw that you recently retweeted an article about Steve Kerr. Are you a Golden State Warriors <laughs> fan or just a defendant? No, no, I am a Golden State fan. And unfortunately, it's hard to watch the Warriors and the Rockets uh, play. Yeah. And in fact, um, my partner, Ben Horowitz, has these fantastic uh, seats to the uh, Warriors games, literally right next to the bench. And I didn't get to go this time. But in prior, prior series, I've had a chance to sit there when the Warriors are playing Rockets. And uh, all my friends from Houston basically text me and accuse me of being, uh, you know, kind of a turncoat. So... I told them, look, if you buy me tickets courtside at the Rockets, I'd be happy to sit there as well. But so far, nobody's taken me up on that offer. You said if you weren't a venture capitalist, you would sing country music in Nashville. Who are some of your favorite artists? My favorite, favorite artist is uh, the Zach Brown Band. My wife and I, it's a very funny story uh, since we're sharing personal stories here. But uh, when I first met my wife, I always listened to country music and I didn't know, obviously, what her music choices were. So. Mm-hmm. I changed all the radio stations on my car the night of our first date to be normal, you know, rock music or whatever. And it was only kind of after that that we finally opened up to each other and admitted, you know, the uh, the guilt of being a closet country western music uh, fan. So that was probably part of the reason why we ended up together. Well, kind of going off of that, I mean, Zach Brown is certainly a band that's popular across the country. But we we're talking earlier about being on the coast. So that's yep. New York and San Francisco. But there are a number of startups that are based in Alabama or based in Detroit or, or across the Midwest. And obviously, you know, they have funding. There are different VC firms that would love to take them on. But kind of from your perspective, you know, there's a lot of tech developers that are based in Silicon Valley. You might have more resources on the coast. What's kind of your take on the argument that, that there's cities and then there's, there's across the country? Yeah, so I think there's no reason over the long term why we shouldn't have more Silicon Valley-like places, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we have talent is incredibly well distributed, both, you know, quite frankly, both here in the U.S. and abroad. I mean, just to, so you have a perspective, you know, the U.S. used to have a stranglehold on venture capital. So we were about 90 percent of venture right. capital about 20 years ago. Today, it's about 50 percent. So that's that's definitely diversified. But I think the thing that people forget that about Silicon Valley is, look, it takes a long time to build these network effects. So one of the things that has made Silicon Valley successful mm-hmm. is that, you know, you're right, you have this confluence of engineers and a confluence of financiers. 
you know, all that's taken a long time. I mean, you could almost date Silicon Valley back to the early days of Stanford in the late 1800s, where mm -hmm. kind of there was always this intersection between academia and industry. You can certainly date it back easily to kind of, you know, the, uh, you know, military industrial complex and a lot of what gave rise for, you know, semiconductors. So that's not to say that other geographies won't exist and thrive. But I do think people sometimes forget that it's taken, you know, 70 to 100 and, you know, 20 plus years for kind of that network effect to grow over time. And so it, it will just take time for some of these new geographies to get there. Interesting. I mean, and obviously just with California, Silicon Valley may always be Silicon Valley. I guess we'll have to wait and see, but but it's expensive too, you know, so. It is. I think there is a real question, and I don't know if it's in my professional lifetime or maybe my kids, but I think there's a real question over time, you know, between just the cost and the, you know, the the lack of affordable housing, you know, mm -hmm. lack of public transportation. I mean, there's lots of things as, as, as spoiled as we are in many respects by living in Silicon Valley. There's there's lots of challenges and in particular, you know, the look, the income, you know, that has been generated from these businesses has not been, you know, well distributed. So I, I think something's going to have to change over time. I don't know if it will have an immediate impact on the business, but it, it seems hard to believe that we can go another 10, 20, 30 years without some changes in the in the political climate and uh, to make it successful. Mm -hmm. You were once a marathoner. Yes. How many races have you completed? I've done 10 races. Wow. And then I had to hang up my shoes. So Major, still, major cities? The one I did uh, that I, was my favorite was Boston, but I will admit in full disclosure, I was working for HP at the time, and <laughs> I had an HP ticket as opposed to qualifying on my own. So it was a fantastic experience, but I, yeah. I do not want to take anything away from people who actually qualified for real for Boston. Would you compare the process of venture capital raising to running those 26.2 miles? Yeah, it's a good point. I think there are many similarities, which is that, you know, kind of at some point in time, right, kind of physical inertia does overtake kind of, a, you know, pure intellectual skill in many respects. I think it can be that way. I mean, part of what I hope that people take away from the book is it, I don't think it has to be that way, which is I think part of the reason sometimes why it takes so long is either the business, quite frankly, may not be suited for venture capital in the first place, or people kind of, they go to who they know in the industry, and that may not just be the best people, not that they're bad people, but they may not be the people who specialize in the type of company they're doing or the stage of financing they're doing. And so mm -hmm. some of what I hope people get here is that the industry is not kind of this, you know, monolithic uh, industry, but there are different kind of pockets and stages and, you know, industry specializations that are important to understand. So maybe that turns a marathon into a half marathon at least and, and makes it more accessible. Right. To your point, the early stage versus the late stage. Correct. And those special specializations. Right. If I could sum up Andreessen Horowitz based on my research talking to you, it would be authenticity, I would have to say. When you come in, you look at founders, the companies who've pitched to you, the companies that you guys have invested in, how would you sum up the firm? Yeah, I think authenticity is a great word. I would say transparency certainly is something we try to do. And again, you know, kind of that's a, a lot of what the book tries to do is to say, hey, look, we, we shouldn't have to compete on information asymmetries. Let's, com let's make sure everybody has a level playing field. The main word, though, I would use is respect. So uh, the foundational value that we have at the firm is respect for the entrepreneur and respect for the entrepreneurial process. Okay. And what we mean by that is, particularly since so many of us came from the startup world, we recognize that, look, we sit in a very privileged seat here uh, on the VC side. You know, kind of, you know, 99% of the hard work is done by the Stuart Butterfields and by the, you know, Brian Chesky's of Airbnb of, of actually trying to build a company. And it's an incredibly difficult process. And unfortunately, the likelihood <laughs> of success is pretty low. Right. And so... Most of what we kind of try to do every day and most of what we try to kind of uh, align our employees around is, look, you have to drop everything else and just recognize that you have to respect the entrepreneurial process. We get back to people when we say we're going to get back to them. We give feedback when we're going to you know, tell them we're going to give them feedback. And we also recognize the limits of what we can do, which is we don't run these businesses. Mm -hmm. The best we can do is be coaches and sounding boards and facilitators and help. But at the end of the day, you know, our, our fortunes are in the hands of these incredible entrepreneurs who are doing great work. I want to switch to another topic entirely, okay. and that is cancer. You're the vice chair of the investment committee for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. You recently tweeted out an article from the New York Times on how AI is helping provide doctors with a more accurate readings of CT scans used to screen for lung cancer. And you wrote, software is eating radiology, a nod to Mark Andreessen's 2011 right. Wall Street Journal op-ed, Why Software is Eating the World. Cancer has touched so many of us with a powerful vengeance. How have you been able to utilize your network and resources to help the fight? Well, you know, I've done, you know, practically nothing is the real answer in terms of making a difference. But uh, as a firm, what we've done, as I mentioned, is we do have a bio fund. And a lot of what that fund is doing is hopefully using things like computer science and artificial intelligence to help improve both the diagnostic process of being able to kind of identify things like cancer early, and then hopefully potentially over time finding therapeutics. So 
we're big believers in that kind of biology is really undergoing a significant revolution, kind of very similar to kind of the computer uh, revolution that we had, you know, kind of in the 60s and the 70s. And we think this kind of marriage of, of life sciences and computer science really has, uh, you know, tremendous opportunity in front of us. You know, in a small way, I was privileged to be able to join the investment committee for St. Jude. And, uh, and you know, I try to support the organization as much as I can. It's a wonderful place. They basically, you know, treat people for free and have, you know, an incredible both uh, you know, on-site treatment center, as well as kind of, you know, making all their protocols known to other right. people in the world. And so it's a great institution. And, uh, you know, as I said, I do, in, in reality, I do very little, but uh, I'm privileged just to be part of the organization. Was that kind of personal based? I mean, I know you said your dad was a doctor and yeah. just... Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, I, I've been generally lucky. My mother-in-law, unfortunately, passed away from cancer, but, you know, kind of, I generally have, we've been generally lucky in terms of I have not had a lot of, uh, of that in the family. And it was really more, um, I just, I got to know the organization. Actually, originally, once when we were raising money, that's how I met the, you know, kind of the people on the investment team. Yeah. And I just found as I dug in, it was just an incredibly interesting organization. The, the thing that struck me the most is how successful they've been in terms of, you know, fundraising, uh, but not, you know, they have plenty of corporate sponsors, but I think something, I'll get this wrong probably, but their average donation is like 17 or $20, right? So oh, wow. they've done a great job between fund runs and cash register collections and stuff like that of being able to kind of identify with a very, very broad cross-section of uh, the U.S. and as well as uh, the rest of the world. And to be the combination of kind of an incredibly, you know, kind of financially successful and self-sufficient organization coupled with kind of the research and the treatments they do there just, you know, got me hooked. Jumping over to another topic, one piece of coverage that I was really proud to help promote at Forbes was our um, reporting last year on the launch of All Rays. Mm -hmm. It was in March 2018, and yep. that was spearheaded by Eileen Lee, a VC veteran in her own right and founder of Cowboy Ventures. And it was an answer to the lack of female leadership in Silicon Valley. I mean, the numbers, they were pretty bad. To quote the article, as of 2018, at 74% of U.S. venture funds, there are no women decision makers. At 53% of the largest funds, there are no female investors at all. It's getting better. This year, Andreessen Horowitz added three female general partners. Correct. You're the father of three young girls. What's your hope for them? Should they choose to follow your path or, you know, strike it on their own? Yeah. So, look, I think you, you everything you said is 100 percent true, which is, I think, as an industry, both in terms of the venture industry and, quite frankly, the startup industry more generally, you mm -hmm. know, we have not done a good job in terms of both gender diversity as well as ethnic diversity. And so uh, we are trying to do, you know, kind of a few things uh, at the firm to help improve that. We recently launched, you may have heard, uh, something called the Cultural Leadership Fund. Right. And the idea behind that is really to kind of, you know, better tie in African-American business leaders and celebrities mm -hmm. with the startup community, both to kind of create business opportunities. And then we're also taking all the fees and carry from that we generate from those funds and donating them to nonprofits mm -hmm. that will hopefully help improve STEM and other, you know, kind of engineering and, and technical wow. resources for African-American students. But you're absolutely right, you know, on the on the, uh, you know, female GP side of things, what we found over time was we had a very hard criteria for a GP, which was we said you had to have been a founder or CEO of a company. And we had lots of reasons at the time for why we thought that was a good idea. But what we, of course, learned over time is that by its nature was a very kind of limiting in terms of what the funnel of applicants we could bring in just because, you know, the unfortunate reality is obviously there are not that many diverse founders and CEOs of companies. Mm -hmm. And so what we decided about a year and a half ago was that what we were really going after was, how do you find people who are maximally attractive to the very best entrepreneurs in the domains in which they are? And so someone like Connie Chan, who's got mm -hmm. incredible depth in China, was very attractive to lots of entrepreneurs who wanted to understand that. Uh, Katie Han, who joined us on the crypto side, you know, about as deep as anybody could be from a regulatory perspective. And so we, we realized that that was really what the right criteria should be. And that enabled us, therefore, to be able to kind of, you know, look at a broader funnel and identify, you know, three incredible uh, folks on the GP side. Well, it looks like the future is bright in that area. I hope so. Yeah. As we wrap up, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Is it the thought of, you know, funding the next great tech company, playing a role, small or big, in changing the world? Or is it something else? You know, for me... It's the same thing that's always got me up, which is I just like learning, quite frankly, and I like seeing different things. And it's amazing to me, having now been in this business for 10 years, we probably see about 2,000 pitches as a firm a year. Obviously, I don't personally see that many. Right. So, but if you think about that, call it order of magnitude, you know, 20,000 pitches over the last 10 years. What's amazing to me is I would have thought that a lot of times we would walk out of the room and say, oh, that's a terrible idea, or I've seen that a thousand times, or I can't believe somebody's like devoted their life doing that. Like I can count probably on one hand over the last 10 years, the number of times where we have come out and we haven't said, we may not have agreed with it or we may not have thought it was a great, a great business idea, but you know, the number of times we've said, hey, like that's just an uninteresting, uninspired idea. And so to me, that's what I really love is 
the variety, the learning. I love working with the portfolio companies. And, and quite frankly, as we talked about, recognizing that, you know, there's there's only so many things I can do because I'm, I'm just not close enough to the companies at the end of the day to be able to kind of, you know, give give great advice other than hopefully be a sounding board and a coach with the companies. But uh, it's, it's a fantastically uh, privileged opportunity. Scott, Andreessen Horowitz's first and third flagship funds, $300 million and $900 million respectively, look like they'll return five times their money to investors. Your $650 million second fund and $1.7 billion fourth fund are expected to return three times their investment capital. I mean, the money, the, the numbers are, are very high. What's the secret? Well, I'm going to leave the numbers to other people uh, since, uh, you know, I, I certainly we certainly don't talk public about our numbers. Mm-hmm. Look, I think what has you know, enabled us to kind of, you know, be successful in this business is that we we really do have a differentiated value proposition. And so, again, if you go back to kind of where we started this conversation, you know, our whole thesis for the firm has been that capital will no longer be the scarce resource. And therefore, for venture capitalists to be competitive, they really have to be, you know, they have to be attractive to entrepreneurs in the sense of being able to do something that helps them with their business. And so I'd like to think that we've been successful because if you talk to our entrepreneurs, I think they'll tell you the ways we've been able to add value and help them with customer opportunities or hiring the right folks have been important inflection points in the business. And I think if we keep doing that, then, you know, the the investment results will ultimately be there. But, uh, you know, right now we've got to work on the day-to-day tactics of just being of value to our entrepreneurs and let the rest of it work itself mm-hmm. out. Experts in the field. The book is Secrets of Sand Hill Road, Venture Capital and How to Get It, available on bookshelves June 4th. Scott, thank you for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks so much for having me. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Scott Cooper, managing partner at Andreessen Horowitz. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. Got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show? Email us at icehouse at theice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Peter Ash with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Teresa DeLuca signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 